So um, I think there's probably still a few people <coughs> slowly finding their way. So I just wanted to get started um, with a brief introduction, thanking you for coming to this year's MSA workshop. It's always great to have a lot of people here and, and sort of um, get to interact with you and hopefully teach you how to use MCEL. And so um, one of the things we always try to do to be very interactive, you know, ask lots of questions. And we have lots of hands-on sessions where we hopefully can get you all started and um, help you with your project. So we'll have an introduction of everybody in a second. I just want to introduce myself real quick. So my name is Marcus Dittrich. I'm the director of the National Resource for Biomedical Supercomputing here at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center. And I'm also part of this new center called MMBIOS, the National Center for Multiscale Modeling of Biological system, Systems that's um, funding and organizing this workshop. And I'll say a little bit about this center because I think it's interesting and sort of is, is, is kind of a nice new um, center that kind of sets the stage for where we want to go in the future with all these modeling approaches. Um, before I get uh, to introduce everybody, I just want to go through the um, agenda real quick so you kind of see what we have planned. Fortune my resolution here is very strange. So the workshop will run Monday through Wednesday. So what we'll do today is, and, and we'll do this every day, we have lectures in the morning and the afternoons are reserved for hands-on either tutorials in the computer lab right next door here or working on your own projects, whatever you prefer. We have tons of tutorials, so there's more than enough tutorials to cover three days, but some of you may have projects that want to get started, you want to get started on right away, that's fine too. And so this will be um, your time. We won't do any of the talking, you do the work and we help you and you ask questions as many as, as you need to. So today is sort of the introduction um, to MCEL that I will do after the um, finishing the welcome part and then Tom will do uh, an introduction to Cell Blender, which is our new, I'm calling it integrated development environment for MCEL, but you know, it's, you'll see what it is and it's, it's, it's going to be a very nice tool for you to um, help you with preparing your simulations. Then tomorrow we'll have a little bit more in-depth introduction into sort of the methods underlying MCEL, the Monte Carlo, so the theory a little bit more, so you'll see a few more equations. Um, and then we'll have an introduction to rule-based modeling that will be conducted by Jim. So that's another approach that's very powerful and, and useful for complex reaction networks. And you'll hear more about this uh, tomorrow. And then, um, again, have hands-on tutorials in the afternoon. And this one's giving up its ghost. And then we have, on Wednesday, what I call advanced MCEL and rule-based modeling topics. We'll talk a little bit more about things like surface reactions and, and other, other bits and pieces that um, are very powerful, a little bit more complicated and complex, so we'll save this for later on. And we'll actually also have another tutorial on Wednesday that's not on the agenda, covering another tool called um, Cell Organizer. Um, so it'll be a one-hour tutorial. Um, that's a tool developed at Carnegie Mellon University, a very, also a very powerful tool that you can integrate with Cell Blender and M Cell, so there's lots of opportunities to really use all sorts of approaches to hopefully find the best way to deal with your biological problems that you may have. And then we'll have Q and A, but we're here all three days, so you can do Q and A whenever you need to um, throughout the workshop. So feel free to ask questions. Um, we'll try to keep everything sort of very. Um, informal, so feel free to interrupt if you have questions or um, since we're filming it, I'm going to try to, sometimes I may just cut things off and then we can talk more in depth later on to not make the video um, too uh, lengthy, but hopefully we'll have enough time to talk. So I wanted to start briefly with introducing the MCEL team. I hope I got everybody. It's alphabetical, so no importance is implied here. So we have <coughs> I know, so we have Tom Bartol from the Salk Institute sitting here in the front. We have Deepak, I think I saw him, um, Deepak here from University of Pittsburgh. We have Jacob, who is over here. He's our, our cameraman as well. 
myself, Jim Fader in the back here, um, Bob also in the back, and we have Jose. I don't haven't seen him yet, so he's probably still. Okay, all right. So, so this is the MCL team. We'll be here for most of all of us will be here, so you hopefully have enough time to talk to all of us. And so, what I wanted to do briefly is maybe for each of you to say just a few words, who you are, where you're from, and sort of why you are interested in MCEL or what your research questions are. So it would be very useful for us to just kind of get a picture of what the distribution of biological questions in the audience is, just kind of see what's, what, what your interests are. So maybe should we just start in the front here and then just go? Probably, yeah. It, it gets broader every year. It's, it's, it's good. So um, I'm just going to, I wanted to, let me just see, very briefly tell you about this, um, about a new center that um, was recently, about six months ago, um, funded here at the, here in Pittsburgh. It's called the National Center for Multiscale Modeling of Biological Systems, or MMBIOS. Um, and sort of, it's a, a collaboration between um, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, the Salk Institute, University of Pittsburgh, and Carnegie Mellon University with the goal of developing new, new methods to investigate um, spatial organization, temporal evolution, um, with a focus on, on neural signaling systems. So this is um, a very challenging goal, and, but we have um, a number of very strong um, uh, institutions in the field, so we hope that um, oh, PC. There we go. And so, what what the goal is in the center is to really um, come up with new ways to really span um, sort of the large scales inherent in biological systems. So. Um, as we actually heard when we listened to some of your projects, there's people working at that uh, um, molecular scale, looking at biomolecules, using MD simulation or some coarse grain approaches, or maybe even using quantum chemistry. So this is sort of the smallest scales um, spatially and also in, in terms of the time scales that are involved. Um, if you do MD simulations, you're typically talking about nanosecond simulations. Maybe you can get a microsecond, but then it gets already kind of difficult, you can use Anton that we have to get a tens of microseconds, but that's already very challenging. And then there's this cellular scale that we're actually mostly dealing with during this workshop where we look at things that are at the level of cells or subcellular compartments, synapses, whatever. Um, and so this is on the micron scale and the time scales are typically milliseconds, maybe it's seconds, could be longer. So this is sort of the typical length and time scales. And then one level up is, is the level of um, tissue where you actually have many cells, many hundreds, thousands, millions of cells that form some sort of tissue. For example, if you talk about neural systems, you would be talking about um, uh, neural circuits that might be the, the actual tissue you're thinking about. And so we have, we have in biology, so we have this large range of scales from the molecular to the cell to the tissue yeah. level that span a whole wide range of time and length scales um, from things that happen um, at the angstrom length scale, maybe those are enzymes where you have bond breaking and bond formation, so very small and fast time scales to the cell level, to the tissue level. And so this, the challenge really here is that we, we do have approaches, and I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute, we do have approaches for each of these areas, right? We have MD simulations, we have M-cell perhaps, we have other approaches here, but the problem really is that we, that we, we can't really connect them very well. And, and so one of the goals of the center is to really find better ways to integrate amongst these scales and amongst these approaches to really come up with something that you could call a multi-scale approach. And so this is um, you know, so this is sort of a buzzword, and it's, 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 it's going to be a very difficult um, challenge to really come up with something that's truly multi-scale, but the hope, the hope is that we can find sort of ways to start along that path. 
So it'll certainly take a long time um, to maybe come up with something that's sort of working and perfect, but uh, the goal of the center really is to um, integrate groups from all these areas that talk to each other and, and find ways how these things could be integrated better. And so this, um, I'm not going to belabor this anymore. I, I sort of also, I always show this very busy slide. And so, so the goal here really is it's also the, the challenge is also your challenge because you have a biological problem. You have a question that you want to answer using some computational approach. And, and your challenge is to find the right computational approach to solve your problem. And that's often not that easy um, uh, due to that compartmentalization of, of the le time and length scales we have. And so this, this slide basically shows from the most detailed in terms of length and time scale to a more coarse grained level sort of from something that's looking at um, individual atoms or even electronic degrees of freedom, quantum chemical approaches to approaches that look at the whole cell level. You can see there's a whole host of different um, theoretical methods that can be used to approach your problem and accordingly different tools you can use that sort of incorporate these algorithms. And so the challenge for you is um, perhaps to find the one that's best suited for your, for your problem. And maybe you need, need more than one. But so if this is something, you know, if you're starting out in this arena, good for you to keep in mind and to think about before you, before you get started. You know, look around. What are, the, what are good tools that could really help me find an answer or even pose a question that I'm interested in? And so during this workshop, we'll mostly focus sort of on this middle level where you have tools that look at the cell to subcell level, level um, and you'll actually hear about three tools. You'll hear about M cell, you, you hear about Bionet Gen, and you hear about cell organizers. So you actually see some breadth in how you could tackle could tackle these these questions. But it's sort of something that's really um, sometimes, in my opinion, not appreciated enough that you really should think about, you know, what's the best approach to solve my problem. And if you use the wrong approach. It may take you either a long time to get to some answer that may not be even the answer that you're looking for, or you may not get the answer at all. And so even within, this is my last slide sort of for the introduction before we come to M cell, even within these um, area of cell simulation tools, there's many different <coughs> kinds of tools. Um, and so here's a list of a few of them, and sort of the, the distinguishing factor perhaps is how they deal with the spatial or particle resolution of your system. There's approaches that don't deal with particles at all. They just deal with a continuum approach, concentrations of molecules, concentrations of you know, neurotransmitter or whatever you have in your cell. This would be, for example, a tool called virtual cell. Then there's approaches that have particles, but they're not distinguishable. Um, these are tools like here. And then you have um, tools that deal with particles that are distinguishable. So you could, so they're fairly highly resolved at the particle level. An M cell would be one of them. Um, an M cell uh, is actually among all the tools, probably the one, and I'll come to this in, in, in my M cell slides, is, is among the ones that can deal best with um, systems that are spatially very complicated. Um, and, and we'll come to this in a minute. So M cell, if you have something that has a complicated geometry um, at the cell or subcell level, M cell is probably a very good tool for you to choose. Um, and then a second level that we need to address is the complexity in, in terms of the reaction network. That means the, the, the kinds of reactions we have to deal with um, within our system. And, and, and for cell level system, this can be, become very complicated very quickly. Um, and, and it can become so complicated that it actually may in fact be impossible for you to write down all the equations that occur in your system. Um, you have a combinatorial explosion of states, and Jim will say a lot about this tomorrow, so I don't want to belabor it, but there's approaches to deal with that as well. And BioNetGen, these rule-based approaches are one way to really handle these very complex um, reaction networks that, that in an efficient manner. And so one of the goals actually of our MM Bio Center and, and Deepak in the back has made some great strides toward that goal actually is that uh, 
you want to combine sort of the capabilities of the, of the two, you know, the power of M cell in terms of spatial complexity and, and, com and marrying it with the power of bionet gen in terms of um, reaction network complexity. So this is a, one of the um, maybe multi-scale goals that we have, even within this range of cell simulation tools. So you see we don't even, we're not even spanning a lot of space and time, but even within this space, it's already very um, diverse and, 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 and complicated. This is sort of my general introduction. Um, and if you have any questions now, feel free to ask. Otherwise, I'm going to start with my intro to M cell. Um, and I have a lot of ground to cover. How do I get back? Okay. Hope you're not worried. So this is a very high-level introduction to M cell, um, and so what I'm going to do is just motivate a little bit what M cell is. I'm not yes. Yes, I want to. So all, all the materials that I'm going to show are going to be online. So we'll put it online. I'll give you the link this afternoon. So there's no need for you to okay. take copious notes unless you really want to. So they'll be available for you. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is sort of a high-level introduction into how M-cell works and talking also a little bit about the syntax um, that M-cell uses. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail regarding the theory. That'll be tomorrow. So today is going to be fairly high-level. I'm going to talk um, a lot about the, the the syntax to set up M cell simulations, um, so you kind of see what's going on un under the hood. And then Tom will actually give you a demo of our new um, cell blender tool. And if you use cell blender, you actually don't need to deal very much with the syntax at all anymore, because you can do a lot of this in a GUI. But it's still a very good idea to know what the syntax is. You may have to do some hand editing, or in general, um, it's 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 still very useful to know the syntax. So this is why we do both th things. And for the time being, you know, uh, it's, it's still necessary, I would think. And, and also when you want to take your model and, right. and run it in parallel on a supercomputer, yeah, or the parameter space of your model, right. run it in parallel on a supercomputer, it's good to know about this. Is it going to need the right scripts that right. automate things? Eventually, we'll have that capability even in Cell Blender itself. Right. Um, but, yeah, it's still good to know. Yeah. OK, so I just want to start off with maybe one definition of what M cell is. So here, um, it's, it's basically a, a reaction diffusion, Monte Carlo reaction diffusion simulator for modeling computational microphysiology in arbitrarily complex 3D spatial geometries. So by computational microphysiology, you know, it's a matter of how you want to define it. For, to me, it's sort of, uh, biological systems at, at the micron to millimeter length scale, so at the cell level, using realistic 3D geometries over biological relevant time scales, which for these systems typically are a nanosecond to millisecond and up to second. Uh, but you know, it depends, of course, on the specific question you have. Uh, emphasis here really is on complex 3D spatial geometry. So MSA was originally developed um, to simulate neural systems, such as synapses and things like that. And these systems inherently are spatially very complicated. Um, and so this is actually an example of a system that's simulated um, by Tom and his, his co-worker. So this is a, an axon of, of, of a piece of neuropil. Um, and so this just shows, so this is a real M-cell model geometry. And so I hopefully you can appreciate um, that these are not your, your typical cube-shaped or spherical um, cell simulations. They can be very complicated, and MCEL is very good at it. So uh, there, it's not a problem for MCEL at all to simulate geometries of that complexity. That doesn't mean that your geometry has to be that complex. Actually, the examples we'll go through are much simpler. But MCEL is, is, is very good at dealing with these geometries. So if you have something that is very complicated, M cell may in fact be the tool to go. And so this is the reason is that it was specifically developed to deal with these neural systems that tend to be complicated and where the geometry tends in fact to be crucial for the function of the systems. 
But we see other examples where that's not necessarily um, required. So main components of an MSA model is three things, perhaps. Um, first, you need a 3D geometry. I, I write realistic, but we'll see that that can be relaxed for some systems. It may not have to be that realistic. Um, so it depends on your definition of realistic to some degree. So you have some geometry that describes how your system looks like. Um, you have random walk diffusion, so particle diffuse um, uh, using random walk steps, Brownian diffusion. Um, and then there are stochastic biochemical state transitions um, that uh, sort of describe the reactions that happen in your system. So that's what's going on. So particles diffuse within your spaces, um, so they, they take random walk steps. If they hit the surface, they'll bounce off, and so they just move around in the space. As they move around, they discover other particles, and then if they discover our other particles, so A is moving from its initial to its final location along its path, there might be molecules B and C, and then as they move along, um, if there's a reaction defined between A and B, they check and test for these reactions using um, probabilistic um, algorithms, and you know, these reactions may happen or not. And so this is basically how M cell um, deals with diffusion in 3D spaces. So it's a little bit different from other, um, some other Monte Carlo reaction diffusion algorithms in that we do ray tracing in M cell. And so I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow, so I don't want to belabor it. Um, so one way to move particle A to its final location is just you take it and you move it, and then you look around yourself and see is there anything I can react with. This is not what M cell does. M cell actually um, ray traces from its initial to its final location and discovers particles as it goes. So if there's, if there's a higher concentration of B molecules around where it starts, um, it'll, it'll, it'll have a higher, it'll react with those more, more. So basically it's sam you have a better sampling of your space that way. So this is how M cell works. So, so these are three ingredients, geometry, random walk diffusion, and um, uh, state, stochastic biochemical state transitions. And so you can see they can be quite complex, so they're, they're, they can be, you can model fairly complicated systems using that. Um, so the software pipeline goes like that. So you start, typically start off with um, your geometry. Um, you have to generate meshes, so we'll come to that in a minute. Um, so, uh, so geometries in M cell are described by surface meshes, triangulated surface meshes. You may have to annotate these meshes, so you may have to identify regions on these meshes corresponding to, you know, biological um, things in your system. Like if you have, say, a membrane, there may be certain patches that contain different types of molecules. So you have to define what these patches are. Um, so this is what I mean by annotation. Um, then you have to specify non-spatial model parameters, and we'll come to what that is. You simulate, then you visualize and analyze the results. Um, maybe I pointed out right here, so the visualization part is crucial. Um, so this is a spatial model, and there's tons of things that can go wrong if you build a spatial model. Um, you have to, if you have a spatial model, not only have, do you have to describe the reactions, you also have to place molecules somewhere in your model. They may be inside something or outside something or on here or on here or on here. It's very easy to get that wrong. You place something, you think you place something on the inside, but you accidentally place it on the outside and then you look at your output and nothing happens and you wonder what's going on. So typically by just looking at your simulation, you can detect these things very easily. So that's just a recommendation to you when you start preparing your model and sort of start refining it, look at it very frequently, and make sure everything is, in, is where, it, where you think it should be. So that people have wasted lots of time looking at the reaction data output and looking at why a concentration of some reactant and not understanding at all why it is the way it is because they sort of prepared something. And the more, the more spatially complex your model gets, the more you know, potential for getting something wrong there is. So, so you know, especially in the beginning, until you're sort of settled with your model, it's very crucial that you look at it 
carefully as frequently as possible. And often, preparing a model involves some sort of iterative cycle. You know, you come up with an initial model that's a good first, you know, first order approximation. You simulate, you look at the output, you realize, eh, you know, it doesn't really reproduce the experimental constraints I have very much. I need this to, need to add this and that. So very often we do this sort of loop, you know, first order approximation. Look at the output. You have experimental constraint. Um, uh, you realize it doesn't work so well. You add something. You do it again, and until it hopefully converges at some point. Um, and so this is probably one other thing to realize is you, you need for a, a a powerful model, you need a lot of experimental constraints. So it's, it's good to think about these in advance. Otherwise, you have um, lots of parameters, but you don't know what, what they're supposed to be. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through these steps sort of briefly. Um, if some, some of that sounds a little bit abstract at this point, you'll do it yourself this afternoon. So hopefully, once you do it yourself, it'll become a little bit clearer. And so I'm going to start with mesh generation a model geometry creation. And so there's basically two ways you can do it, um, two, two basic ways you can do it. Um, the method number one is that you actually reconstruct your geometry from um, electron microscopy data. So you, you really need to have a very detailed model of your synapse, your cell, or you know, if you do the liver, I don't know, probably some hepa hepatocytes or something. You need to have a really detailed structure of them. So you have electron microscopy data, um, so you basically, somebody or you, or you or somebody else images it for you. You, you take you know, pretty pictures of, of your sample that's finely sliced. You have to reassemble it into a 3D image stack. You have to align it. Um, you have to um, segment it. And then eventually you'll have to um, convert this into a computational grade mesh that actually MSOC can use. So this is one way you can do it. We have done it uh, a number of times. Um, and it's, it's a quite a successful approach. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the pro and cons. And so if you do that, you have, can have a very detailed geometry um, that really represents the system you're interested in in, in, in great detail, sort of at the, you know, at the level of nanometers. Um, the second way you can do it is you basically, you say, well, I, you know, I, I don't need to have um, that much level of detail, I can really, I can really do by just looking, by just creating an average model. So I know the the dimensions of my system also from experiment using freeze fracture, for example. You know, I know the length of my system. I know how many particles I have. I know approximately the height. And so, if you do that, you can actually generate your uh, geometry in silico using Cell Blender. Um, and and this is something. I do a lot, and this is also something you'll do this afternoon. So this is also a very successful approach that can be quite appropriate for many systems. It, it's still um, fairly detailed. You know, it's based on real experimental input and data, but it's not quite as detailed as you would get from an EM reconstruction. And so I, I think I'm going to try to show you two movies real quick um, of um, so first, there, this is sort of a movie that shows, how can I do full screen? So this is a, a, right, so this is a movie of um, sort of the second approach where we basically have built a system in silico. And so this is a neuromuscular junction, so there's a synapse between an axon, a nerve cell here, and a muscle fiber. So this is actually a fly-through running M-cell simulation right now. So, so this system is built um, using you know, average dimensions from um, experimental results. And so you can see here, down here is neurotransmitter-filled vesicles. Um, these are called active zones. There's also voltage-gated calcium channels down here. We'll fly into this. Um, in a second, a little bit more, you can see a little bit more detail. Um, you can see these red dots buzzing around. These are diffusing calcium ions that have entered the terminal through voltage-gated calcium channels. So we do in an MSOS simulation, we basically stimulate the system using an action potential. So you apply an action potential. These um, calcium channels 
here in the middle open stochastically, the blue ones are closed, the red ones are open. Calcium enters the terminal and it binds to receptors here um, at the bottom of synaptic vesicles. And using sort of these simulations, we can study questions related to the structure and function of these synapses. We can ask how many calcium channels are there? Um, how does this um, vesicle release apparatus look like? This, this the snare complexes and synaptotagmin molecules that actually bind the calcium ions and trigger the release of these synaptic vesicles. We can study the effect of drug molecules, um, for example, that block these calcium channels. So, so these are quite um, powerful models that you can build using Cell Blender. Um, and if you're probably a Cell Blender expert, you can build this model maybe in a day or so. Right? It's, it's Maybe two, but it's, it's, fa it's fairly, <laughs> fairly quickly, fairly rapid, and um, quite powerful approach. So this is the sort of in silico way of building an M cell model. And using Cell Blender, of course, you can make these nice movies. And so then um, there's an awesome movie, I think, for the second. So this is a movie that shows the reconstruction of, um, so this is basically the approach where you use electron microscopy images. So these are the slices. So each of these is a slice that was taken, an image of a slice that was taken of a synapse here. It's also neuromuscular junction, so you can see here those folds. And through a fairly elaborate process, you can, you can actually use these slices and reconstruct them to come up with a fairly complicated and complex mesh that represents your um, biological system. So you can really appreciate here, you know, the, the spatial complexity of this synapse. So this is, is if, if you look at a real synapse, it's amazing how complicated and convoluted these systems are. And Amcel is, is extremely good at simulating these kinds of systems. So maybe the question you're after really needs this type of spatial resolution to answer the question that you have. Maybe not, but if so, you can use a reconstruction like that as the geometry for your M cell model. Okay, so it, I think it continues to go on, but I hope it sort of shows you the kinds of spatial complexity that you could if you needed to simulate using M cells. So. And I think this is one of the tutorials, right? The red NMJ? Uh, I'm not sure. No, that's a different system, yeah, right? It's a different system. system. But it's right. A, it's a different uh, right. synapse. Right. But we have we have sort of a tutorial that uses one of these more complicated geometries. So if you're interested, you can actually use it this afternoon or tomorrow for some trial M cell simulations. Okay, so let me just stop this. And go back to my slides that um, Okay, so we saw this one, we saw this one. And so just to briefly give you sort of an idea, of, you know, why, why would you use one over the other? There's always pros and cons, and every time you do um, develop a model, M cell or whatever, there's always, there's, always back, you know, there's always some decisions you have to make. And so the, the pro for these, if you do an EM reconstruction, is it's very accurate and has very high degree of spatial um, and structural detail that may be crucial for the question you're actually after. So maybe the, the the question you're trying to answer using an M cell simulation really requires that level of, of spatial accuracy. There's some significant downsides to this approach in that it's a lot of work. Um, so you have to first you know, take the biological sample, somebody has to image it, you have to, re re you have to align the 3D image stack, you have to segment it, um, and then you have to basically convert the segmented mesh into a computational mesh that m -cell can use. And um, even, I think, if you're a very experienced worker, it might take you six months to do that. It might take you a year to do that. 
it could take a long time. So it's not something you want to do um, five times during your PhD. So this would probably be half your PhD to actually get that mesh. So it's, 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 it's a lot of work. So this is the main downside, I would say. Um, there's maybe one other one. And so the, the, the in silico generation using cell blender, the one we saw with the, with the frog um, neuromuscular junction, is that it's straightforward. It's, it's fairly quick. Um, of course, it's, you need to have some experimental constraints, the dimensions, whatever is part of your system. But if you have that, you can, you can do it you know, within a day or within a couple hours, depending on the complexity. And one of the advantages also is that you have a lot of flexibility to play with your geometry. So if, if your interest is, you know, how, how does my system change if I make this larger or m move these things further apart, it's very easy to do in cell blender. It's much more difficult to do this with a reconstructed mesh. Um, the cons, of course, is less detailed. Um, but if, if that's you know, relevant to the question that you have, that's something you'll have to answer for yourself. But it, it may, in fact, be a good idea to start with that and just see how far you can get. And if you realize, no, there's no way I can use this sort of um, in silico approach to, to get the right answer, then you can always go this route. But you know, it really depends on the question that you have. But these are sort of two approaches that are available to you. And, and the cell blender approach is something that you'll do a lot during this workshop. And so hopefully once you're comfortable with cell blender, you can basically create any geometry you want, which doesn't, of course, solve the problem um, completely because you still have to know something about your geometry. You can't just make it up. But once you know enough about it, cell blender really allows you to do basically any geometry you can think of. Okay, so now we have the geometry. We have meshes that describe our geometry. Um, and now we need to um, add something else to our model. Three things, basically, molecules, reactions, and we need to tell M cells something about the kind of output we're interested in. In terms of molecules, I guess that's fairly straightforward. You just need to um, know what, what are your, the main players in your simulations. You need to know their diffusion coefficients. And since it's a spatial model, you need to know where they are in your simulation, right? So they could be everywhere, but they could be in, in more spatially localized positions. So if you place surface molecules, you have to ask yourself, are they on the whole surface, or are they located just in these patches here? So basically, once you have a spatial model, you can't just only place molecules. You also have to think about where to place them in your simulation. Then reactions. That's, um, again, you need to, of course, know what the, what the reaction pathways are in, in your simulation, and then write them down as uni or bimolecular reactions. Um, and so we'll see how this, how this works in more detail. But you have to write them down explicitly. So if you have um, 50, that's fine. If you have a very complicated reaction network and you have 10,000, then it becomes tricky. And this is where approaches like um, uh, Bionet Gen can be very helpful to actually help you deal with this complexity. But did, did you have a question? Yeah? No. Oh, okay. So molecules, reactions. Oh, yes, yes. I have one question. Uh, mm -hmm. So what's the difference between this one and the, like, for example, 30 people may have been using it? Because you need a need the diffusion coefficient. Did you say CFD or? Yeah. Well, CFD would probably use some finite element method, right? So you would use partial differential equations. We do, this is a stochastic approach. We don't use partial differential equations. We deal with explicit particles that diffuse in space. So it's, it's, it's actually sort of a fundamental difference in terms of the um, approach to, to dealing with these systems. And actually, um, Finite element methods are very, very tricky to implement when you really have these complicated meshes because you have to sort of, met, you know, so sort of subdividing the volume for for the for this um, for this uh, neuromuscular junction would be would be a, a tricky business using finite element methods. You have to have very fine voxels. It would be very computationally expensive. Actually, for these types of systems. These Monte Carlo reaction diffusion approaches are actually very, very efficient ways of, of, of dealing with the spatial complexity. 
And what you often have in these systems is that the, the number of molecules you're dealing with is actually fairly small. So for example, um, people always think in concentrations, millimolar and molar, whatever. But if you do the math and if you, if you compute for these small spaces what the actual number of molecules is that you're dealing with, and especially if you do PDEs, you'll find that maybe in a voxel you have you know, 0.1 of a molecule. So then it becomes kind of tricky conceptually what that actually means. Um, and so it's these, these reaction diffusion uh, approaches that MCEL uses are actually very, very good methods to, to deal with that, um, both the small number of molecules and then it, that it may not be well mixed. So, you know, the concentration may, may actually be different depending on where you are in your system. But it, it, it's, it, it, is, it, is, it would in principle be a viable approach, but it's sort of, um, you know, given the so the systems we're interested in, the cellular systems that are often complicated geometrically and small numbers of molecules, these reaction diffusion approaches, I think, are more appropriate. But again, it depends on the system that you have. There may clearly be large cell level systems where um, these finite element methods may be better. And in, in, in fact, what would be best if you, if you would combine the two. Um, you'd have, you sort of have a, um, you know, some parts of your simulation may be simulated using finite element methods and some bits may be simulated using that. So I think this may be a future avenue also for us to do that you sort of do this multi-scale approach that some things are, are simulated using continuum methods and some are simulated using these particle-based methods. But yeah, very good question. Yes? In the simulation issue, as you know, I'm not sure Um, the, uh, I didn't mention. So the wide was actually. Um, just, I just wanted to yeah. Like other people, uh, you, you have the mic on, so. Other okay. So, so the question, the question was in the simulation that I showed the white molecules, um, what these were, right? And so the the white molecules are, were actually um, calcium bound buffer molecules. There's a lot of buffer in this terminal, and we actually didn't didn't show the buffer. So there's. 50 million buffer molecules in there. So it's basically full with buffer. And so the only molecules that were shown were diffusing calcium ions and calcium ions bound to the buffer just for clarity. But there's lots of buffer in the system. So was the density like that? <laughs> the density is two millimolar. It's actually not known for the frog neuromuscular junction. Um, but so the buffer is a tricky, bit, tricky issue because buffer is a very there's not just one buffer in there. Buffer, there's lots of buffers in there. And so, so the buffer is probably a decent approximation, but we don't know enough. It could certainly be improved, I think. But it's, it's, I think it's a reasonable approximation to what you could expect to be in that system. But it's, buffer is, is difficult. OK, so we have molecules, reactions. And the third important part is to you have to sort of specify what kind of output you want from your simulation. Um, and there's two kinds of output that you can request in an M-cell simulation. One is for visualization output. That's data that you can actually look at in Cell Blender to see you know, where your molecules are diffusing, if everything looks fine, and you place the right molecules in the right compartments, and you know, you may want to make a movie for a presentation or something that you can also do in Cell Blender. Um, and then, but sort of, I think, in terms of your analysis, mostly um, you want to um, output reaction data. Um, OK, so I think I'll come to this later on. Right. Yeah, so I'll say more about this later. So there's, we typically look at reaction data, which is basically just simple counts of concentrations of molecules, numbers of molecules in, in all kinds of different areas of your simulation model, the whole model or you know, on, on this patch of the surface. So it depends on the question that you have. We'll, we'll see in more detail what that means. Um, then you simulate the model. And so this is how I still simulate uh, models. So basically, um, the language that we use to describe M-cell models is called model description language, MDL. 
And we'll see in a few minutes what this really means. It's basically a programming, programming language to describe MSL models. And they're simulated um, on the command line. You just type MSL, then the file containing your model description as MDL, and then MSL runs and produces whatever output hopefully runs if you have not made any mistakes, and hopefully produces the kind of output you've asked for. Um, what we often need to do is, uh, MCEL is, is a stochastic reaction diffusion code. So each simulation is one sample out of a huge number of, of possibilities in terms of simulation. It has a random number generator. So in order to um, get at the answer that you want, you typically have to run many hundreds or thousands, depending on the question that you have, simulations, and average over result. Um, and so this is another maybe advantage compared to these uh, finite element methods is that using these approaches, you get both the average behavior of your system as well as the fluctuations um, around this average behavior, which, which can often be a very crucial and useful, useful insight into, into the, your system behavior. So you, you get a little bit of insight into the noise and variation inherent in your system. Um, so if you use cell blender, it's actually possible to simulate your M cell simulation from within that cell blender environment. You might never ever have to type this, but most likely if you run your simulations maybe on a supercomputer or, or some cluster, just because your desktop is a little bit too slow for that at some point to run tens of thousands of simulations, um, you probably have to go back to that level of, but it's, it's fairly simple. And we'll, we'll show you how to do that. So, um, Oh yeah, visualize and analyze. I, I, I told you about this already. So basically visualization is for looking this data to look you can look at in cell blender. Um, and again, a reminder, do that, especially in the beginning. Once your model is finished, you don't have to do this anymore in principle. Once your model is good and you, you say everything's fine, you can, you can um, quit outputting visualization output. In fact, you should, because visualization output tends to be large, and it slows down the simulation because it you know, have to write to disk. So once Right, and so once, once your model is so, if you're confident, you don't make any changes anymore, everything's good. You might just want to turn it off just to um, not fill up your disk. Yes, one question. Uh, sorry, so for one more question. So just for me to follow you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this one uh, simulates in a static state. Again, please. Static state of your SQ. It depends on your simulation. I mean, it's sort of. Simulate. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But mostly what you're interested in is the dynamics of the system. Right. The time. Time dependence. The time evolution of the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can right. say that time evolution of the system. Yeah. Right. Exactly. That's the main. That's the right. main. Right. Okay. So now the question is that if I have a new homogeneous system, mm -hmm. and I have a static state, mm -hmm. and I have a static state, 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 Yeah, you can do that. Mm -hmm. But generally, we're simulating systems that are very uh, microscopic in length scale. Right. Okay. So, um, uh, you know, micron to you know tens of microns is generally the, the right. Case. Okay. As opposed to the, the, the scale of the whole system that you're right. prepared your model. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think once you set up the simulation this afternoon yourself, it becomes much clearer. What you can do, but there's lots of flexibility in, in what you can what you can do using M cell. In, in the demo that we'll have right after the after right, the Tom will give a demo, so he'll show you. He'll, right. He'll then have a better appreciation of what we're talking about. Right. Thank you. And and so the second kind of output is what we call reaction data output, and these are just simple counts of molecules, typically or reactions, in whatever part of your model you're interested in, the whole model or on surfaces, and, and then you know this data 
you can analyze with your favorite tool, MATLAB, R, Octave. It's, it's just like from your, you know, any other simulation tool. Okay, so, so this is basically um, the high level introduction into how you prepare an AMSA model. You do geometry, you define the non um, geometric parameters, molecules, reactions, what kind of output you want. You simulate, you look at it. If it's fine, you're done. You look at the, and then you analyze your results. Um, if, it's, if, if something looks fishy in your visualization output, you'll go back and check you know, if you did something wrong, or maybe you realize your, your results don't really match exactly what you know from your experimental constraints. So you go back to the drawing board, maybe enhance your model, maybe you need to add another state, maybe your geometry needs to be refined, and so forth. And so now what I wanted to do is in the next half hour or so before the break and then before Tom starts his demo is to just walk you through briefly through MDL, our um, model description language, how this looks like, what the basic idea is, how it's sort of the, the basic commands, and then so that you kind of see how it's structured and how you set up a basic simulator. It's very straightforward. Um, there's many commands. We have an online guide called the Quick Reference Guide that you can download from mcell.org. It has many, many more mcell commands that I won't go through here in detail, but sort of what I will show you are sort of the basic commands that will allow you to actually generate a fairly um, detailed model. But before, I, um, before I'm going to talk about um, MDL, I wanted to mention one more thing. Um, about um, basic definitions and units. Does anybody know what, what that is? Anybody? Yeah? What is it? It looks like the Mars lander, I think. Yeah, it's, it's a Mars thing. So it's, it's actually the Mars climate orbiter um, that was lost, crashed, and burned in 1999. And anybody know why? Yes? Units. Units, right. That's the right answer. So it crashed basically because some, of, some part of, the, of, this, of, of this thing expected SI units, and, and another part of this thing delivered units in pound seconds instead of newton seconds. So there's a little conversion factor between the two that was missed. But it basically cost, I don't know how much this thing cost, but probably a couple hundred million dollars. I'd say probably a billion. Probably a billion dollars. Very, very trivial mistake, right? I mean, something you do in your homework, perhaps, for, for uh, you know, some 101 or 102 class. You just miss a little conversion factor. But it, right, but it can have really, it can have really severe consequence. In this case, it was basically whoever was in charge of that probably is very upset about this at this point. And so basically the message is don't let your MSA model become the next Mars Climate Orbiter. And it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's sort of a funny story now, but it's really not that easy to get it right. And so you really need to be careful, especially um, if you look at the literature, there's many different units floating around. Sometimes people don't mention the units. Sometimes they're wrong. Very often they're actually wrong, um, because so it's, you know, it, that's sort of the beginning stage of your model development is getting all the, all the parameters, and so take take enough time at this stage. You don't want to realize after one year that your parameters are wrong, and you've you've sort of simulated with something that you thought was in, you know, centimeters square per second, but they actually listed it as micron square per second, and you're three orders of magnitude off. So it, it's it's good at this point when you start setting up your model, think carefully about the units. And actually, it's something we realize because RuleBender has also a little bit different units than MSO. So even when we do this, you know, we think we, we, should, we should be smart enough. Even when we just want to interface to a tool that's developed in the same center, we're facing already the same task that there's, you know, everybody has the little units, and you have to be very careful that you get it right. And you're very easily a couple orders of magnitude off. Happens happens very fast. So, so we have an opportunity with self-lender to be able to right. get 
right? And, and so just I, I'm listing them here. I'm mentioning I'm, I'm mentioning them again later on, but it's good to keep in mind spatial dimensions in M cell are always microns, ten to the minus six meters. Time is in units of seconds. Diffusion coefficients are in units of centimeters squared per second. Reaction rate constants are in per second and per mole per second for uni and bimolecular reactions. So fairly straightforward, um, but it's good to keep in mind. So whenever you grab some parameter from the literature, make sure these are the units. If not, you'll have to convert them. And in any case, if you get parameters from the literature, it's always good to not look at one not just to look at one paper, but at two papers, and make sure they at least agree ballpark figure-wise. So if, if there's a two order of magnitude difference, you might want to become skeptical if the units are correct. So there's a lot of, lot of unfortunately, bad. Um, and skepticism is always yes. a great right. um, attribute, a virtue that scientists have. Right. So even with your own results, right? Right. Exactly. Compare back to what you expect the answer to be. Right. And if you don't get what you expect, um, it could be that your expectations were wrong, <laughs> and accumulation was right, or vice versa. And even and if you get and if you get what you expect, be skeptical. Right. Why did I get what I expected? To be? Sometimes it's good to get something that you don't <laughs> expect because it, it it requires you to think if everything works out perfectly. In cell modeling, it's suspicious, I would just think. <laughs> it usually is not that easy. But. OK, so I call this your first model, MDL. So I'm just going to walk you through preparing by hand a simple M cell model. It has simple geometry, a couple molecules in there, reactions, and we'll create output. If, some, if not all of that makes sense to you, that's not a problem. You'll do it this afternoon. It's just like learning a programming language. You, you best learn it by doing it yourself. But hopefully that'll give you sort of a high level overview of, of what's going on. So basically, um, model description language, MDL, has commands. Um, MDL commands are always written in all caps. Um, so, and they're typically of the form that it's just an MDL command equals to some value, or they're organized as blocks. You have an MDL block, and there's something else inside. Um, these blocks can be nested. So for those of you who do C++ or Java, it's sort of like you know classes, and you can you can nest them. In. Uh, that said, um, since MDL commands are all caps, it's a good idea to um, not define anything else that's not MDL in all caps because it gets difficult. Even though you can, but M but um, M cell is case sensitive, so it's good to just only do the MDL commands, all caps, and everything else. Do, don't do all caps. Otherwise, you'll just confuse yourself. And we designed it that way on purpose to right. make it easier for people who aren't computer programmers to right. read and, and look and say, oh, that's an MDL command because it's in all caps. Right. And so, so let's start with our simulations. The two things you always need for any simulation, you need to define a time step and a number of iterations. So. That's perhaps at the top of your MDL file. Iterations equals to something. Time step equals to something. I have sort of, I'm explaining here one other very useful facility in MCEL. You can define any kind of variables you want. So what we do is we define two variables. One called iters is 100, and dt is 1 times 10 to the minus 6. And we use these variables that we have defined here. Um, to set the number of iterations, 100, and to set the time step, 10 to the minus 6 seconds. seconds right. Um, Good. So this is just a convenience. It's useful because sometimes you need to refer to the time step that you have in multiple places in your MDL. And so it, it's, it's just like in programming, it's good to define variables. Because what you might do is later on, you decide, well, I'm going to change my time step. And you do it here. But you forget to do it you know, in these five other places that you should also do it, but you just didn't think about it. So it's good to define these kinds of variables in the beginning. So you change it here, and it's changed everywhere. But that's just, you can do it with everyone. Yes, sorry? Is it iters the 
Right. Mm -hmm. Both, because each iteration will be 10 to the minus 6 seconds. So 100 iterations will be 10 to the minus um, 4 seconds total time. So basically, each iteration is 1 dt. And how many time steps? Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you can use, um, within MDL, you can use comments. These are C style comments for those of you who do C programming. So you can have multi line comments like so. And you can also have single line comments like in C99. So and it's, it's good to comment your MDL. It's just like if you write a program. Um, it's good to be very verbose. You might want to put in where you got your parameters from, perhaps, you know, what, what, what paper it came from. Um, it's just like with, for those of you who are programmers, you know, you think you, you write your MDL today, and you think, oh, I, know, I, I remember. But then, you know, you look at it in two months, and you have no idea anymore where all these things came from, where a case came from. So it's good to put them either in the MDL itself, or you have a good um, lab notebook where you put them in. But it's, it's, it's a useful place to put them into the MDL. But it's, it's you know, I, that's the way you work. And a feature missing from Self Wonder right now is the ability to add right. Okay, so, so this was basically the reaction simulation prolog. We defined number of iterations, the time step. Um, for the time step, that's sort of something some pe people ask, you know, what should I set my time step to? And that really depends on your simulation. It depends on um, the kinetics you have, your reactions may have. So if you have a fast reaction kinetics in your system, your time step needs to be shorter because you need to, and we'll come to the, why that is in more detail tomorrow. And also, the, the larger your time step, the longer your diffusion steps will be each iteration. So if you have a geometry that has very fine detail or you need to sample that spatial area very, that's very, you know, that's nanometers in diameter, um, it's not a good idea that if your diffusion um, step per iteration is a micron because you will have trouble sampling that area. So you need to think about your system. You need to think about both from a geometry point of view, what is it that I need to sample? So what is the smallest length scale that I need to be able to sample appropriately? And that will actually determine then how large your DT will be together with the diffusion coefficient of your molecule. So you have to think about this a little bit. So not you can't just put in a, a, a a microsecond. So it really depends on your system. So it's something to consider carefully also. So MCEL will give you some diagnostic output yep. as it's running and when it's finished that you can look at to get an idea about yeah. whether you should make your time step right. finer. When we talk about the theory tomorrow, there's it'll become more obvious why you know there there is the sort of a restriction that's due to the pro probabilistic nature of M cell. But just for, for now, so that the DT is something you need to think about for multiple points of aspect. So, so Albert Einstein said you should, you should make your model as simple as possible, but not simpler. Right. So how do you know? <laughs> right? And then to paraphrase that, you're, you should make your time step as coarse as possible. Yes. For computational efficiency, right? But not coarser. So right. there's, there's a science and an art All right, so, so this basically, we have our simulation prologue. And now, the, if you remember our sort of flow chart, the next thing is to generate the geometry. And so the geometry I'm going to generate for this model is, is going to be very, very simple. So my background is in physics. Um, I'm not going to use a sphere in this case. I'm going to use a cube. So it's, it's going to be a cubical system. This is cell blender. I think it's an older version. And since Tom will show you in, in, in detail how to use it. I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm just going to tell you that I'm going to use Cell Blender to create this cube. Um, and I'm going to use, um, in this case, Cell Blender to actually save the, save the mesh that makes up this cube into an MDL file. And I'm going to show you briefly what's in this MDL file. So the MDL file that I'm going to export using Cell Blender is called cube MDL. Um, and so, what I'm 
showing you here is another feature that you can do in MDL. It can include other MDL files. So I could have just copied and pasted this file cube.mdl into this MDL file. It's typically a much better idea to include these MDL files. First of all, it's, it's much easier to structure your simulation. And um, these mesh geometries tend to be very complex. You know, it's like tons of vertices and elements. So you don't want to clutter those up your main MDL files. So inclusion, including files is always, I think, a very nice thing to do. You have a separate one for geometry, for reactions, for molecules. It's very nicely structured. But again, it's up to you how you want to work this. Um, the inclusion is sort of lexical, means uh, it's more or less, cop you could imagine it as being copy and pasted at this location. Um, and so that means there's a little bit of an order dependency, right? So if you refer in one file to some molecules, you have to define them first. So you can't just, so it, it's not too severe, but it, it's fairly obvious typically that you have to first define the things that you're going to use in, in something that comes later on. If you reverse that, um, you may get some error message that, oh, you want to place this molecule, but I don't know what that molecule is. So you probably define the molecule after you actually placed it. So that's something to keep in mind. So this is how this cube.mdl file looks like, just for your information. So these surfaces that we use to describe geometries in MCEL are triangulated meshes. So all of these surfaces consist of little triangles. Um, in our case, we have a cube, and so this is an example of this little triangle. So a triangle has three vertices, one, zero, one, two in this case, yeah? Um, and you describe a vertex, and so basically your cube has three, your cube description has three parts to it. It's a list of vertices, x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z. It has a list of connections. Basically, you tell, you say, how is vertex zero? Is vertex zero is, no, so, sorry, this describes triangles. So, you basically say vertex four is connected to vertex zero, connected to vertex three, and this makes up a triangle, right? And the indices in there right. are the. Exactly. So, this is, this is vertex zero, this is vertex one, vertex two, vertex three. Um, so basically, we're connecting uh, this vertex and this vertex and this vertex to make a triangle. So this is a lot of detail. You don't, if you, since you're using Salpern, you don't really have to deal with it, but it's, it's good to know. And basically, the order in which you enumerate these vertices determines the handedness of your triangle. And that's actually important. So basically, if you connect vertices 0, 1, 2 as 0, 1, 2. Um, you define the normal vector of this triangle using the right-handed rule. So right-handed rule, the normal points in this direction. So your, your triangles have um, a front and a back. Right? So if you, if, you would do, if you would define this triangle as 2, 1, 0, the normal would point down. And so if you want to have a surface, an M cell, say a closed surface, you have to make sure that all the triangles the surface is made up of has all the normal vectors pointing either all outward or all inward. So it has to be consistent. And this is, this is sort of um, the tricky bit, for example, if you do an uh, electron microscopy reconstruction. Um, if you just, for just visual purposes, it doesn't matter at all whether normal, if the normal points in or out. It matters a lot to EMSA because EMSA really cares what's, what's the top, the front, or the back of a surface. If, again, if you do the surfaces, if you do your geometry creation in EMSA uh, in cell blender, it's done for you automatically. You don't have to worry about it. But it's good to keep in mind. So basically, this describes the cube. Um, since we have a cube, we have eight vertices, right? One, two. And we have how many faces? How many triangles, sorry? Twelve, right? You have six faces, and each face is triangulated, has two triangles. So we have 12 triangles, so 12 triangles. And then we can do one other thing. We can, we can collect sets of triangles on surfaces and define them as what we call surface regions. So you could, for example, say, well, I want to um, 
I want to specifically mark the top of the cube or the bottom or the left or the right. And of course, if you have more complicated surfaces, you just say, I want to be that, I want to have that collection of triangles on my surface correspond to some region. So you can do this here. You basically define a region that I call top. It consists of two triangles, and these are actually the triangles at the top of my cube. So this way you can define arbitrarily complex regions on your surfaces that corresponds to something uh, presumably in your biological system, like a patch of membrane or some area where there's some receptors or postsynaptic density or you know whatever. So you can create any kind of collection of, of regions um, that you want using this approach. And again, it's, and Tom will show that to you, so I should move on. Using, doing that in Cell Blender is actually very straightforward. It's, it's basically visual. It's just paint and say, this is it. Um, buh, 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 buh. OK, so I think, yeah, maybe one thing that's important to point out is if you define a mesh, by default, they're reflective to all molecules. So if you define a mesh and you put molecules inside, they'll stay inside which is probably what you want. You can make them transparent. So you can generate geometries that are transparent to certain kinds of molecules on a per-molecule basis. And that's often useful if you want to count molecules. You, have, you just want to put a box somewhere and, and just want to count in this small area of space you know, the concentration of molecules. You, make, you create a cube. You make it transparent to that molecule. So it's basically not there for, the, for all the molecules concerned, but you can count inside. So it's, it's, a, it's a very useful feature, actually, to have. You can also make it absorptive. So you can make certain regions in your model. Once molecules hit that boundary, they'll just get absorbed and disappear. So that can be useful. Um, OK, so basically, we have now our geometry. And what we always need to do is, in any M-cell model, we need to instantiate sort of a main world object that actually describes what's in the simulation. By just including objects, you're not really making them part of your model per se. You're just making it available to be part of the model. Um, if you wanted to actually make it part of the simulation, you instantiate um, this world object, and then you add all the, all the geometry objects that you have available to your model. In this case, we only have one, so we just we just add one, um, our cube objects, to our simulation. Um, it's, a, it's a little, so as you add these molecules, you can, you can, you can um, do a couple of geometrical transformation. You can, you can um, translate them. You can scale them if you want, for example. So you could, you could actually add this cube 10 times. and. You add a first cube, you add another one that's moved over by a micron, you add another one that's moved over by a micron. So you could use this single cube as a template to build up a model that consists of 100 cubes that are sort of somehow stacked up, for example. You can scale them. So, so basically, these meshes are your primitives of your simulation, and you can build up the real simulation using them. And so in this case, we'll just add a single cube, so we don't do anything fancy, but we could if you wanted to. So where it says cube object, cube there, it could have said cube one. Right. Object, cube. So it's basically, object, cube. this is your te te template name, and this is sort of the new name. In this case, we name it the same. I, sh I should have actually renamed it, so this would be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, OK. So basically, this is what I told you. So you can. You can combine these objects into larger meta objects that you can um, transform, you can translate, you can rotate, you can scale. So it's, it's, a, it's a useful way to build up your model. It's sort of a little bit, um, you know, if you use Cell Blender for your model generation, you may not have to do this so much anymore because all these ge geometrical kind of manipulations you can do in Cell Blender as well. So it's, that's how we used to do it in the old days. I still use it, and it's still useful. But if you use Cell Blender, you can do all of this actually within Cell Blender. So it's but this concept of having objects right. be nested. Right. You also have in Cell Blender, you have yeah. a parent object, a child object, and the child objects can have children themselves right. to build up 
So, so basically at this point where we're basically done, we have a working MCEL model, I should say. So you can run this model. It's not going to be very interesting because it's just a geometry with nothing inside, but it will run um, and, and actually run very fast, but um, <laughs> for not too surprising. So now, okay, next step is we'll need to add some molecules. All right, so let's add some molecules. For this simple example, we'll, add three mole we'll, add, we'll have three molecules that participate in this model. We have two volume molecules. And so by volume molecules, I mean molecules that are 3D molecules that diffuse in 3D space. Um, and then we have one surface molecules. And surface molecules are molecules that are on a surface. You place them on your mesh geometry, and they only diffuse on the surface. So these are the two kinds of molecules I have in M cell, 3D molecules and surface molecules. And they can all react with each other if they want to. So you can have a volume molecule react with a surface molecule. You can have a volume molecule react with a volume molecule. And you can have surface molecule react with surface molecule. So they can all arbitrarily interact with all of each other. And we'll, we'll make an example later where you can see that you can actually build quite nice things using, using that capability. And, and you can have volume molecules that interact with the surface itself. Right. And so molecules are defined using a defined molecules block. So this is one of these MDL blocks I mentioned before. And it's, it's very straightforward. It's basically you have this block. You give, it, give the molecule a name. And the only way you distinguish 3D and 2D molecules is basically by giving the volume molecule a 3D diffusion constant and giving the surface molecule a 2D diffusion coefficient. So, so basically now we have defined these three molecules. They have the diffusion coefficient, again, units of diffusion coefficient centimeter square per second. Um, okay, we come to this in a, in a second. So volume molecules really are point particles, so that's something to keep in mind. So they have no volume, and so there's no crowding or anything going on. So you can pack as many volume molecules as you want. Um, in your space, in principle. So MSO won't keep you from packing them um, at an infinite density. So they're just point particles. It's a little bit different with surface molecules, and we'll come to that. So surface molecules in MSO actually have an area to them. And so there's going to be crowding on surfaces if you, if you put too many surface molecules on them. And, um, and then, Marcus, oh. say it before, but the names of the molecules, the names of your variables, <coughs> Geometric objects that you define to be, they can have any name you want. Yes. Right? And so you can name them really confusing things. Like you could have named your surface molecule ball, you know, ball one, right? So, but generally when you're doing this, you're, you're going to name the molecules the name that they have, like calcium or, right. or you know, AMPA receptor or, yeah, but or we, um, a corin. It would certainly allow you to shoot yourself in, 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 yeah. in the foot. So. Yeah. But you know, again, don't, don't make them all caps. You'll just confuse yourself. Yeah. OK, so, so step one, we have defined molecules. Nothing has happened. So if you run the simulation again, it'll be as fast as before, because nothing has changed in our simulation. Really, we have to find some molecules. But um, what we have not done yet is we haven't actually <coughs> placed any, right? So we <coughs> haven't told MCEL how many of each and where to put them. So that's the next step. So we need to define and release molecules. And that's typically done using release site blocks. So you see there's two additional blocks here where we release molecules. Um, we re release um, vol 1 molecules and we release surface molecules. The volume 2 molecules are not being released. They're being created as the simulation runs. So you don't need to create all the molecules that you have because some of them may not appear until later. And so basically, if you want to release volume molecules, you have to release them. Volume molecules you have to release in, a clo in some closed space. You don't have to. You don't have to. But typically, you want to do that. And so you have to define the shape. Um, you give the release at a shape keyword that, that tells MCEL where to release them. 
In this case, we actually release them within the cube. So this is a syntax to release it in the cube. Um, so you have this hierarchy of names in MCell. Maybe that takes a little bit of getting used to. So the, your main simulation is called world in this case. So you can give it any name you want. We call it world. And then um, this is the cube object within the world. And so basically your shape is world.cube. So the dot separates these different levels. So basically what we say, what we tell Amsel is release a volume, one molecule within the cube. Here we specify the molecule, volume one, and we tell it how many to release, 2,000. So it can release by number, it can release by concentration, whatever, whatever you prefer. We do the same thing for the surface molecule. For surface molecules, we um, can actually release them on certain regions on our surface. So I could have released the surface molecule surf one also on the whole cube, so everywhere. But I can be more, I can be more specific. I, I can say, well, I actually want to release it on this top region on my cube that I defined before, so the top part of the cube. So this is your way to release surface molecules wherever you want on your geometry, so on a per triangle basis, really, right? So you define the region, in this case it's top, and you say, I want to release it on there, I want to release a surface molecule, I'll come to that little thing here in a second, and again I release 2,000, so that's how I release surface molecules. Um, okay, so, um, right, so one thing I need to talk about, and this is always a tricky part, I'm sort of, I'm going to go into some detail, there's going to be more talk about this perhaps on Wednesday, and, and this is probably really something you need to try yourself and think about, but I'm just going to tell you what's going on here. So, and you'll see it in the demo that again. Exactly, oh yeah, right, right. And so, so here you can see I have a tick mark here when I release the surface molecule, and so I'm going to try to explain to you now what this tick mark means. It's actually quite meaningful. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about surface molecules. Um, and by surface molecules, we really mean molecules on maybe a biological membrane. So this could be a transmembrane channel, say, you know, or some receptor. Like this guy, anybody know what this is? No? Uh huh. Yeah, right. Potassium channel, KCSA, um, and if you look at sort of from the from M cells point of view, any surface molecule has a bottom and a top domain. You can actually see this molecule is not symmetric, right? So there there's something at the bottom here that's not at the top. So it has a top and a bottom. From what from the point of view that M cell is concerned, right? So it has you something. Could, you could call it cytoplasmic and extracellular, right? You could, what but. What do I do for uh, an ion channel in a mitochondria? In the, right. In the inner membrane of, my, of a mitochondria. Right. So, yeah, it. it that the uh, words. It hopefully becomes. The compartments don't really. Um, aren't, aren't general enough to describe. Right. So, so this is a notation we use, and hopefully it's, it's always a little bit confusing, but hopefully it'll make sense. So we just. It has a bottom and a top domain. What that is, it's not specified. It's just, it distinguishes the two sides. And you could say N-terminus, C-terminus. Right. Like, but that isn't always correct. Right. And also there are, there are um, proteins called clippates that go around looking for proteins that are misoriented and flips them around. Right. right? So then what, you know, N-terminus and C-terminus being outside or inside the cell or top or bottom. That can right. right, right. So, so we, we call it bottom and top. And then the second thing, the second notation I'm, I'm going to introduce is that surfaces have a front and a back. And the front and the back goes back to that normal vector that I told you about. So the normal of your surface has a direction. And basically, if the normal goes up in this case, then we call this the front and this the back. Just like a real membrane would too, right? I mean, it has. It's, it has a front and a back. And so these are the two concepts. So proteins have a bottom and a top, and surfaces have a front and a back. <coughs> can you call surfaces as an extracellular surface? You can, but it, it really depends on your simulation. It may not be that case, right? So if, you, if you're just simulating a whole cell, then, and your normal vector sticks to the outside, then your top would be extracellular, 
and your, and, and your front would be extracellular and your back would be cytoplasmic. But you know, depending on what you're simulating, this may or may not be the case. That's why we can't and don't want to give it biological names because it really depends on how you map your geometry on your problem, what these names mean. So that's why we sort of have to keep it abstract and you have to map mentally this description onto your model. So I think that's sort of the, the difficulty or the, the thing you have to do in your head, think about your system, um, and, and we'll talk more about it. So it's, it's something that takes a little bit of thinking. So basically, uh, that said, if you have, a, if you have some um, surface, some membrane in your system has a front and a back, there's two ways you can place a molecule in, onto that surface, right? You can, you can put it such that the top domain is at the front and the bottom domain is at the back. So top front, you call, we call it, or the other way around, front back. And so what the, again, what that means for your, for your system depends on you. So, it's, it, it's not, so basically, you have some flexibility of, of, you have two possibilities to place your molecule onto your surface mesh. And this is sort of where this tick mark comes in that I, that I showed you in the MDL. Um, one other thing that I should point out, and I, I mentioned it already, that <coughs> each of these triangular mesh elements in an, in an M cell simulation, so the way you triangulate it in cell blender or from your electron microscopy reconstruction, um, M cell subdivides each of these surface meshes into very into small tiny triangles internally. You don't see those, but that's what's happening behind the scenes. And it does it by default in such a way that there's about 10,000 triangles of these small triangles per square micron. And the rule is that each of these small triangles can only hold one surface molecule. So what happens in effect is that your surface molecules acquire a size, an area, that's given by this so-called surface grid density, which is again by default 10,000 per square micron. Um, if, you, if you do the math, this sort of approximately um, gives each of these surface, small surface tile an area that you would expect a, a typical membrane channel to have. But it's sort of approximate. But it, it's, sort of, it's sort of a fairly decent average approximation of what you would expect a real surface molecule to have. So basically, at that density, if you fill up your surface, basically you'd, there would be no membrane left. You'd, de you'd be dealing with a system that's basically protein with a little bit of lipid in between. And that happens. These systems exist. The postsynaptic density, the acetylcholine receptors are very tightly packed. So it's really something that happens in the real system. So this is something to keep in mind. If you um, place surface molecules, it may actually happen that MSA tells you, you know, look, given your concentrations, I can't actually place that many molecules. That means you have more molecules than fit on the surface. And then there's two things you can do. You can increase the density, um, but you may need to think about what that really means. I mean, as I mentioned, it's a realistic density, so if you, if you, if you put more on the surface, you have to think about what that means biologically. So it's probably a good, good time to step back and just think about your concentration and if that's really a good concentration, if that's really what you want. And of course, um, the more tightly packed the surface is, you, the more difficult it will be for molecules to diffuse. So you have some crowding effects here going on as well. Right. So this is, um, so but let's go back to this little bit of MDL, so I had this tick mark here. So the tick mark basically does that. It places the, the top domain on the front of your surface. If you wanted to have it the other way around, you would use a comma, and that's this. And if you don't care, you say, well, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So you basically say my, your surface molecule is, you know, has no preferred direction you give it um, a semicolon. And if you place molecules using that, MSA will randomly place them this way and that way. So you should have approximately a 50-50 ratio of those. Um, so these are the, the possibilities that you have. And 
Um, we'll talk briefly about reactions. We'll talk more about those on Wednesday. When you, when, once you start thinking about reactions, you have to draw pictures and make sure you understand the topology of your system. So this sounds a little bit abstract, but it's actually quite straightforward. And hopefully, once I go through the reactions, it makes a little bit more sense. So, <clears throat> so what we have done now is we have, yes? The, the molecules themselves, the surface molecules themselves, are actually, again, point particles, but they always occupy a, a, a tile, yeah. right? So basically, if a, if, if a surface molecule is on a given small tile, and another surface molecule wants to diffuse onto that tile, it, 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 uh, it can't. Okay. So yeah. basically... So basically, the just one So basically, so on the surface, it's, it's, they don't really collide per se. So what, what happens on the cur surface is um, a, uh, you have a so one molecule will diffuse. So it will go a certain direction with a certain step length. And if that tile uh, at that final position is available, it it'll just go there. And then it'll look around itself and see, are there any reaction partners that it could react with? If no, then. That, that's it. If yes, then it'll test all of these possible reactions. There's probability associated with each of these reactions. Then uses random numbers to decide if any of these reactions will occur. So basically, there's no collision itself. It basically goes to, tries to diffuse to a tile that's available. It'll just go there. That's the diffusion step. And then it'll discover if there's any reactions it, it, it could undergo. So that's on the surface. Um, in the volume, there is in the volume mo molecules don't have a size, so they basically um, you can pack them as densely as you want to. In an MSO simulation, of course, it still has to make biological sense. Yes. Can, can a molecule interact with multiple surfaces, or, or, or not? Like, if you invested two absolutely yes, and have two surfaces very close together, could it cross? And interact across two surfaces at the same time? At the same time, no. It's basically, if you have a volume molecule, so you have, say, say you have layered, mm -hmm. a layered set of surfaces, and a volume molecule goes that way, it'll interact with the first surface. Whatever interaction you have defined, maybe it's a reaction of some sort, it'll check, does that reaction happen? If yes, whatever you have defined happens. Maybe it ceases to exist, it's being absorbed, or it cr creates some other molecule. If it still exists after that reaction, it just continues on to the second surface, does whatever is defined there. And so it continues until it's done with its diffusion time step, or it just has disappeared due to some reaction or it something. It can interact simultaneously with two surfaces at the same time. It can, and sort of what, I mean, what do you envision? What would that mean biologically? I mean, uh, two membranes, uh, a, a channel, for example, that, that is in mm -hmm. two membranes at the same time. Uh, so it's lost within those two membranes. It's like surface multiple. Um, yeah, surface multiple membranes. I had to think about so that's between membranes. So you, I don't think can can single proteins do that, yeah, or sure. can, or are there multiple proteins in the there, there different membranes proteins. that 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 you link can have a reaction each other. where they're bound. Very yeah, I don't think I don't think that's straightforward. There's probably some tricks. Sometimes there's there's sort of tricks we can play. We should yeah. talk about it in more yeah, detail and discover. But I mean, there may be some ways to do it. So, we yeah. but we probably should explore what what the exact questions that you have. Yeah. Yes. So the bleach is it real? Is it a law actually in the non-bleaching process? So, so the gameplay is. Is it a law? Is it actually involved for the diffusion? Well, actually, I'll talk about this a lot tomorrow. Sort of the the mathematical underpinning. So maybe, hopefully, tomorrow it'll become clearer. If not, we can talk. So it's basic diffusion. Um, Fickian diffusion. So we'll talk a lot about this tomorrow. Hopefully, that'll make a little bit clearer what the math behind this is. Yes. Uh, 
Well, the diffusion coefficients that you would use are, are typically the free diffusion coefficients. They take into account that there's water, that we, implicitly the solvent, but they don't take into account the you know, interactions between the actual biomolecules. So this would basically be something you put your protein in a solution, uh, at a sort of diluted solution, and then you measure the diffusion coefficient coefficient there, but there would be, there's nothing else in there. There's no cell, membrane, and other. Yeah, but still it would increase what you could call the friction inside the program. The but, you, but you will get this in an MSA simulation. Basically, if you have a lot of reactions between molecules, they'll actually slow down. So you get this anomalous diffusion effects. You, you can get those. But the, the diffusion coefficient that you would actually give these molecules would be the free diffusion coefficient. They wouldn't take into account. You basically you abstract away the water molecules. Um, okay, so I need to move on so Tom has time for his tutorial. Um, but I think I'm getting close. So basically, we have defined molecules. We have placed them. Now, um, so this would be a little bit more interesting simulation. Uh, molecules would diffuse around in our simulation. Um, but what we, of course, want to define is some reactions between the molecules. And defining reactions is fairly straightforward in M-cell. Again, you have a defined reactions block. And reactions are defined using this syntax. Reaction, reactions are on the left side. Products are on the right side. They have a reaction rate constant. And you can name them if you want to. This can be useful if you want to count how many reactions of this type happen, but it's not required. So we, we have three reactions in this simulation. So volume molecule one becomes volume molecule two at this rate. So this rate is one per second, per second, right? We have this reaction here, two volume molecules of type two combine to become null, so this is sort of a special keyword. This is annihilation. As soon as two of these guys meet, they, for some magic reason, they just disappear. So this is probably not a very biological example, but who knows. At this rate, and we just give it a name, annihilation, so we can count how many of these take place. And then we have sort of, hopefully this makes sense. It's very straightforward, just bimolecular and unimolecular reactions. So the more, most complicated part is probably this reaction where you can see this now involves the surface molecules. And as soon as you have a reaction <coughs> that involves surface molecules, you'll have to deal with a lot of commas and apostrophes to handle the directionality that you have due to the surface. So this gives you actually a lot of power and flexibility. And we'll see a lot more of that um, this afternoon and also over the next couple of days. And let me just explain briefly what's going on, I think. Right, so basically as soon as you have a reaction that involves a surface molecule or a surface, um, you have to specify the relative location with which this reaction takes place. And so in this case, um, if you draw a picture, and actually if you deal with surface reactions, it's a very good idea to draw pictures. Um, to actually draw your surface and draw your molecules and draw sort of spatially what it means. It's very helpful. So basically, the reaction that we have um, specified here is the following. So the, the, the comma and the apostrophe here um, specify the relative orientation of surface and volume molecules, also relative orientation at this point. And so this notation means that the volume molecule, um, so here it is. So the volume molecule reacts with the bottom part of the surface molecules, because they're on opposite sides. So if you draw the picture, you have a surface molecule, you have a surface, you place a surface molecule, top front in this case, and the volume molecule reacts with this the bottom part of the surface. And on the product side, you can see the, these two guys are both apostrophes. That means that volume molecule interacts with the top part of surface. So this is how it looks like. 
So this reaction basically specifies this uh, transport process of volume molecule across the membrane mediated via the surface molecule. Okay? Um, in fact, I told you that those are relative orientations, so this reaction doesn't tell you anything about if, if this surface molecule is in the surface top front or front back. Right? So, it, so it, this reaction also specifies this reaction. So in this case, you pump a volume molecule. Let's just say, if you look at this at the surface, the back is the cytoplasm and the front is the extracellular side. So then this process pumps it from the cytoplasm to the extracellular side. This pumps it from the extracellular side into the cytoplasm. And which of these reactions takes place depends on what kind of surface molecules you have. So if you place all your surface molecules into the membrane that way, this is the reaction that's going to happen. Right? Because I said, this surface molecule sits in the membrane top front. So if you define this reaction, volume molecule would get, would, will get pumped out. Could you speculate this type of uh, reaction in an action potential? The uh, sodium moving from the outside to the inside and potassium sure. moving from the inside sure. to the outside. Yeah, exactly. Right. And if you right, and if you would actually place your molecule, so this is we place this this molecule top front, so this is the reaction that would happen in our system. If you would have placed the surface molecule the other way around, this would be the reaction that happens. If you would have placed our molecule with the semicolon, so randomly, both of these processes would happen mediated by this reaction. So basically, the reaction describes what reactions are possible. And the reactions that actually happen depend on how you actually place your molecules in your geometry. Right? So if you plan reactions, if you have a, say, I need, I need a simulation that pumps molecules from the inside to the outside, that, that's what you need. You, you would write this reaction, and you would place your molecules so that they're oriented top front. If you do that, that's what's going to happen. If you say, oh, I need a reaction that pumps, another reaction that pumps something um, from the outside to the inside, you can use the same reaction, but you have to place your molecules the other way around. So basically using that, you can come up with very complicated, very complex, uh, and it, there's even more flexibility that I don't mention here. We can talk about this some more. I think it's already um, a lot of stuff to think about. But in this case, again, just like you should visualize your simulation, if you draw a picture, it often becomes very clear what you want because it tells you how to place your molecules, and it tells you how to define your reactions. And, and if Marcus were to write another reaction that was the reverse of this, the, ver the reverse reaction, right, with, say, a different, with, with a different rate constant, then you can imagine this, that system would right. settle to some equilibrium exactly. concentration on mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then now all of a sudden you have a delta G that you can calculate for, you know, for, right. for the stability right. and energy uh, of, that, of that system. Right. So, so you can see using um, M cells, volume and surface molecules, you can actually describe very complex spatial processes where you know, molecules are in compartments and they're, they're pumped or transported back and forth between different geometrical regions of your model, you know, using different rates. So it's, it's, there's a lot of flexibility. And there's one additional thing I don't show here for now is that it can actually also involve surfaces themselves. And you can have an additional way of specifying reactions. But this is probably enough for now. And I think I have only one more item to tell you about before maybe I'll have a 10-minute break and then, or five-minute break. or. Yes. So, this line, but if we can use another uh, partial pump, let's say, at the top, so we can't transfer that rate. Yes. Okay. Right. So, in internally, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, internally, M cell converts rates into probabilities. Um, so, whenever there's an encounter between a volume and the surface molecules, there's a certain probability for this reaction to happen.
So M cell uses, you know, throws a dice and then basically decides does this reaction happen or not. Mm -hmm. And we'll cover tomorrow right. the, the physical laws right. that govern the system and the and uh, the math, math, you know, the mathematics right. for how we implement those physical laws so that the M cell simulations are physically accurate. Yeah. So there are two more things I think I need to say. One is sort of a digression. Um, is one feature that you can and should put into your M cell simulations um, is that <coughs> you have the ability to partition your model, um, which is which doesn't change anything in terms of your simulation results, but it's sort of an efficiency. Um, efficiency measure and, and you should really do that especially if you have complicated um, more complex um, simulations basically you decide sort of a sp spatial decomposition of your system that allows M cell to um, simulate much faster so it's basically a divide and conquer algorithm so it's it, that um, M cell only in each little cube that you define or rectangle that you define, M cell only needs to t keep track of the molecules in this cube and its neighbors, not in the whole simulation. So if you do that, you can significantly speed up your M cell simulations, um, factor of 10 or 100. So it's really worth your time to, you know, once you're getting ready to do production simulations, to fiddle with the partitioning a little bit. So that's a kind of a sweet spot, uh, you, if, if you keep cranking up the number of partitions, you increase memory use, and at some point you might realize that, that so it, it tends to get faster for some time, and at some point it'll just either taper off, and you just keep increasing memory, or it'll get slower again. So it's typically fairly easy, straightforward to find that spot, but it's worth your time spending 10 minutes or 20 minutes to find that right partitioning for your simulation. It can really save yourself a lot of time. So I just want to mention it because sometimes I see these elaborate models and people don't have partitions and they, you know, they complain it takes forever and then you put in some partitions and all of a sudden something that took two hours is done in, I don't know, a couple minutes. So it's, it's, it can really be a big, um, big time saver. So don't forget about it to do that. Um. There's just two quick things I wanted to mention. This is the, how you specify output, and there's two types of output. Um, reaction data output, um, which is specified using a reaction data <coughs> output block. And what you do here is you basically specify a granularity with which you want to produce output. So it could be you just use your dt variable, which means you output it every time step. But you know, maybe it's sufficient for you to only output it every tenth time step. It's up to you, depending on what you're after. You can um, make it finer than dt. You can make it finer than dt. That's sort of the smallest time uh, we have available. That's good for the time. Right. And so there's lots of, lots of ways you can um, produce reaction data output. If you look in the quick reference guide, there's a num not many more examples. But basically what you do is you count. Um, a name here is either molecule or reaction in some part of your model. It could be the whole world, so this just means the whole model. It could be uh, an object within my cube, or it could be region on some object. Count all the surface one molecules on the top of my cube, for example. But, or it could be in some sampling box. So you can really, you can basically count whatever you want. You can count the number of reactions that happen. Um, the number of hits a molecule has with certain surfaces. So depending on the question that you have, you can basically know everything about all the molecules in your simulation at whatever level of detail you want. And so this is typically the output that you want to um, look at for your analysis. And so th it's very straightforward to specify. I hope that makes sense. You can also do, if you want, do some math with these counts so you can you can have a couple counts and add them up, or if, sort of if you want to count all the molecules in this region plus this region plus this region plus this region. So it's, there's a lot of flexibility there, and um, that's nothing profound. And then the si same thing is you can define vi visualization data. It's a vis done with a vis output block. You have to specify a format. So for you, it's probably going to be 
format called Cell Blender, which is an efficient binary format that Cell Blender can easily and quickly read and use. Um, the only other one that might be useful is something called ASCII, which, output, which outputs the positions of molecules in sort of an ASCII format, which may be useful if you want to sort of parse it yourself using some script and you want to compute something based on that. So that can be helpful too. But if you want to use Cell Blender to visualize, use Cell Blender, you specify a file name, and you basically tell mCell what kind of molecules you want to um, visualize this all molecules keyword just says that all the molecules, but you can specify them by hand, A, B, C, and F. And how often you want the output. So this basically says I want, it, I want everything at all iterations, but it could also be more fine-grained, you know, every 500th time step. And, and if you have a lot of molecules, this can be large. So if you have 100,000 molecules in your simulation, you count all data, all iterations, for 100,000 iterations, you probably accumulate a couple of gigabytes of data very quickly. So um, be a little bit careful at the beginning. But um, OK, and this can be read by Cell Blender out of the box. So um, but it's also very I.O. intensive. It's also very I.O. intensive. It's a data large, but it can take yes. a long time to write it. And so it's going to slow down. Right. Your Right. Um, you, certainly, there are occasions where you really, really do need it in production run. And you know what you're in for, right? right? But, but if you don't really need it for your production run, then you turn off right. the, the biz output so yeah. that uh, you just get your reaction data output. Yeah. And then the simulations will run on that. Okay, I suggest I that we'll have a 10 minute break and then Tom will give a cell blender demo so you see how that works as well.